Hey everybody, welcome to the, uh, the September Toronto Java user group. So, uh, usual housekeeping slide, check out our Google Plus, uh, check out our meetup.com group, and check out our videos. We post all these online, you can go and get them and forward them to your friends and make them go crazy and viral. It's very exciting, we get like 10 million views. On <laughs> All right, so Java news. Uh, there's a little bit of excitement this month with uh, Larry leaving his CEO position at Oracle. Uh, he's still there. He's going to stay on as the CTO, and he's brought a couple people up to replace him as co-CEOs. No, they're not co-CEOs. They're both CEOs. They're both CEOs. The co-CEOs is RIM, right? That's yeah. <laughs> so very strange. Two CEOs. It's a kind of a. An interesting thing. Um, there hasn't been much discussion on how it's going to affect Java, or if it is, or if Larry even had anything to do with Java, or if he knew what it was, other than it <laughs> helped pay for yachts, or I don't know. It's it's a tough one. Does anybody have any any thoughts on what might happen? Wasn't called Java. I think he always liked Java more than the cloud. Until yeah. he figured out that the cloud was code for selling people more computers than they need. And then he was all about the cloud. Right, yeah. He didn't want the cloud at first. No. Then he realized he could sell clouds. The private clouds. <laughs> and he was going to redo OpenOffice in Java. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, they, they, just, they just stole it from Sun, right? They just got in that, that code base and they're like, we're going to turn it into JavaFX. So that was, that was an interesting thing that never happened. So next week we've got Java 1, and a couple of representatives from our Java user group are going to be there, I think? Yes. Uh, Christian's going to be there too, but he couldn't make it tonight. Ah, very good. Um, are you going as Jug Leader as well as presenter? Yes. There's a meeting of Jug Leaders on uh, Saturday night. There's a dinner that Oracle's hosting. Um, so I'll go represent us there. Awesome. That's right. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how the support for Java user groups changes every year from Oracle. It's been variable from Sun being extremely supportive to Oracle being kind of uh, not trying to corporatize them, but not really supporting them that strongly. So we'll see what happens with that. More organized, but less uh, And it's always interesting to get the State of the Union from what Oracle thinks is going to happen to Java and what they plan to do with it and their, uh, their roadmaps which are often uh, quite optimistic and interesting to see. So uh, I, I, they will probably live stream the keynote. So if it works out in your time zone, it might be worth tuning in. Um, some interesting news from CloudBees for people who do a lot of cloud hosting. Uh, they're shutting down their platform as a service called uh, Run It Cloud, I think it was. Uh, has anybody used that or investigated it at all? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like they're sort of restructuring their business and going to enterprise Jenkins support and Jenkins hosting in the cloud. So that's very interesting to see that happen. Um, and I guess it just goes to show that if you're doing cloud stuff, make sure you're a little bit cloud agnostic. Uh, it sounds like they're going to be supporting people to move on to other platforms until the end of October and then turning off the switch end of the year. DevOps is coming up as well, and it's almost sold out, so if you plan on going or want to go, if you can expense a trip to Belgium, then it's really, really awesome. It's uh, tons of fun, so there's uh, like 200 tickets left. It almost always sells out, sells out every year, and it's uh, a great value. Um, the overall cost of going to DevOps turns out to be about the same as going to Java 1 from here when you include the cost of hotels in San Francisco, so it's... Uh, Really awesome choice and just a lot of fun to get that trip out of it too. Are you going to go this year? I'm not, but I'm going to the Chaos Communication Congress this year. Cool. Which work has helped me out with very nicely. Yeah. Um, there's the ever updated Java calendar of what's coming up, conferences and 
Uh, I think call for papers in there, all sorts of stuff. So check that out. It's good to reload it every once in a while. And that's all I found this month. Has anybody else got interesting Java tidbits? <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at remembering news too. So we have uh, two little presentations tonight. We've got Jonathan uh, talking about one of his favorite tools. And we have Luke Shannon talking about memory data grids. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Jonathan. And okay. Well, as it said on that title slide, I'm going to spend five minutes talking about a favorite tool of mine, which is an Eclipse plugin called Eclema or ECL Emma or something like that. Um, and what it is is a code coverage tool. So it lets you exercise your code in some way, like run it, and then see which lines of code actually executed when you were doing that. Uh, and I like the way the user interface works. I like that it's an Eclipse plugin that doesn't hose your installation, as many do. Uh, it's, it's been very safe. I've never had trouble installing it before. So to start with, just how do you get it? You go under the Help menu, go to Eclipse Marketplace, search for, wait, oh, good thing I have Wi-Fi. Okay, ECL Emma. comes up as the only hit. And then if this wasn't installed, I would press install here. And there's a few prompts and then you've got it. So what it does to your Eclipse once it's installed is it gives you this extra launch menu, which is launch coverage or coverage as. So you can launch from here. You can right click on a thing and say coverage as. Instead of run as or debug as, it's another choice. And that's about all there is to using it. So what does it look like when you use a coverage tool? So we'll start here. Yes, uh, there is. So the tool that it wraps, this plugin wraps, was called Emma, and there's a new version that's a complete rewrite called um, Jacoco, which stands for Java Code Coverage. And there is a Jenkins plugin for Emma, and there's also a Jenkins plugin for Jacoco. Um, so this, is, this tool is mostly about the, the UI you get for the coverage. Um, but yes, if you want to do coverage analysis in your continuous integration, uh, Jenkins plugin is definitely the right way to go. So uh, as an example of what you can do, so I just pulled in an old project that I used in a talk here a couple years ago that solves the Peg Solitaire game. Uh, here, so it's, you have like a little triangular board with little pegs in it, and you have to jump one peg over the other and take the one out. Um, so this program with four classes is just, it's a program that finds solutions to this game by trying every possible move. So the question is, uh, if we're testing it, how effective is our test? Is it actually exercising all of the code? Is there any code that's being missed by the test? And just got a few test methods that I whipped up before. So we can take the game state class and make a test method for it. So we're just creating a game state with an empty hole in the middle and then making sure that there are 14 pegs left in the board out of the 15 possible holes. So if we run this test just using a regular run as, okay, it passes, fine, nothing interesting. But if we run the same launch configuration from Eclipse using coverage, something different will happen. Okay, there. So, first thing you notice is that these lines turned green, and that's because they got executed during the test. And the other thing is that this view called coverage showed up, and it's showing that we've, this one test covered 12.4% of all the instructions in that program. And you can browse through here and see coverage by, um, by class. And you can also, it's still 
just the Eclipse Java editor. So you can say go to this constructor and see, okay, when we passed in an argument of five and an empty hole of three, two, it actually exercised every possible instruction in this constructor. So this test, if there was something that was going to throw an exception, for example, probably would have happened here. Uh, but we haven't exercised this private constructor with that test. We haven't called this method at all. We did call this one, and so on. So that's really about it. I'll just I'll add a few more tests and show that the coverage goes up. Yes. It does. Um, yeah, let me run a few more tests and then I'll, I'll walk you through that. Okay, so we'll get these guys. Okay, so this is going to call the legal moves method and make sure that there's two legal moves on a board with one empty hole. And this will apply the first of those moves. And we should see the coverage, which is now at 12.4%, uh, go up. Okay, now we're covering 51.8% of the project. And Wei asked about branch coverage, and yes. So these little diamonds in the margin appear wherever a line of code has instructions that are not necessarily covered just by that line being executed. So it actually counts how many branches there are. This line here has two branches, and we covered both of them by running the test. Um, sometimes it's surprising uh, what constitutes a branch. Like if you have a, um, a Boolean expression with ands and ors in it, you can actually have many branches on that one line of code, even though it doesn't look like there's any control structures there uh, because of the lazy evaluation. So it covers all of that. It actually, this uh, underlying tool, Jacoco, analyzes the bytecode. And then it just at the end, it maps back to where the, the line information is in the class file. So it sees all the branching happening because of your conditionals. And then it says, oh, well, all of that happened in one line of source. So there's seven possible branches within this line. Um, OK, so I'm almost done. One last thing I'm going to show is that it doesn't have to be a test that's exercising your code. It could be any Eclipse run configuration. So I can actually run the main method of this code, which is in this class. So you run as Java application. Okay, so this played 137,000 games, found 1,550 ways to win it, and it took 436 milliseconds. Now, the neat thing about this coverage tool is that it's not very expensive to run it. If I run this same thing uh, with coverage analysis, go back to the console. Uh, why did it? Oh, thank you. There we go. So it only added like 20% to the runtime. And this is a very computationally intensive program. So it's pretty cheap in general to run this. So that's a favorite tool of mine. It's easy to install. I hope you enjoy it. OK. Um, so I'm going to spin the grid up. And we'll look at it come up. And then we'll talk about it. And then I have a slide that kind of reviews. So the whole idea with this in-memory data grid concept is you've got an application you want low latency, so you want to have quick response times. You want to be able to put a lot of data into it and do computations in memory. So you want your logic executing on the data in the same place where the data is actually stored. You want it distributed, and you want it to run on commodity hardware. So you want to be able to basically have a bunch of processes running on a bunch of cheap machines, be able to throw a bunch of data in them, and then do a calculation in memory and get back a response quick. So if you're not looking for speed, you don't really need an in-memory data grid. Um, this particular in-memory data grid called Gemfire is key value store. So we're putting in objects. We have a key object and a value object. You can have nested objects, so it, it's just going to use regular Java objects. We do have the option to put in .NET and C++, C++ as well. We'll talk about that later. Um, from a high level, you can just picture a hash map. So it's essentially a hash map that's distributed across a bunch of machines uh, with APIs to do a few extra things. Now the other thing, so there's a lot of um, concepts. 
so there's time to live. Some of them I think were mentioned on the description. Um, so we'll, we'll get into some of those as well. But essentially we're spinning up a bunch of processes to allow a hash map to be distributed across a series of machines. So let's see how that works. So we'll get it going and then I'll talk about some of the underlying concepts. So this particular VM I'm running is a CentOS VM. Um, it's using the Oracle JDK. Gemfire itself is just a jar file. Um, now it's a jar file that has some properties built into it that fall under the category of group membership. So essentially it's going to use TCP IP and as you spin up this process using IPs and ports, it's going to look to connect to other members in the grid and then depending on how you set up your data design, it's going to look to exchange data and replicate data across this grid as it's running. Um, totally winging it here, so interrupt at any time if you have questions. Now, we created something called GFish, which stands for uh, Gemfire Shell. GFish just gives you an easy way to start and stop and manage that Java process. Um, we'll take a look at the shell scripts and the commands. Right now, what I'm going to do is start up so there's two types of processes. There's something called a locator process and something called a server process. And you'll see this in almost all in-memory data grids. And if you look at MPP databases, things like Nateza or Greenplum, you'll see the concept of the master nodes and sort of the worker or segment servers. Gemfire has the same idea. So the first thing we'll start is a locator. And it is involved in directing traffic. So it's a Java process. It's on a port with an IP and it's going to listen to client connections. So when you're working with Gemfire, I've got my grid, which has got, you know, let's say 16 machines all running this process. I come in as a client. The client has a configuration using the Gemfire API that connects via TCP IP, and I say to the grid, this is what I'm interested in. One of the big jobs of the locator is to say, okay, if you're interested in these data concepts, these are the actual servers within the grid you'll talk to. So after I make that first connection to the locator, I'm talking directly to machines in the grid to get the information I need. And should any of those machines stop responding to me, I'll, my client is configured to go back to the locator and say, hey, this guy stopped responding. I'll get another IP then at that point and continue my communication. So in the in-memory data grid concept, we want to have a single hop. So we don't have to go, we want to minimize the amount of time where we go to multiple machines to get something. We want to make one call and get what we want. Because speed is really the key thing when it comes to this. It's, it's optimized to be fast. So we're going to start up the locator process and then we're going to start up two server processes and they're all in the same machine. The configuration file is, is, is doing a few things. So it's describing the data policies and we'll look at that in a second. But it's also describing the protocols that these things are going to use to communicate within each other in the grid. So I have a default one that we'll take a look at. So it's going to start the grid with this. Now, the first thing is this locator that's starting. This locator also um, doubles as JMX. So it has a JMX manager built in. So once the locator is started, we can connect with all kinds of tools and sort of check in on the state of the grid. So this is the command through gfish, start locator, gives the locator a name. We have a feature called cluster configuration, we can talk about that later. Uh, there's a working directory which contains the PID and all the log files. And then we're giving a port and the IP is the IP of this machine. Um, so essentially we're going to start this process on that port and then any client or any other member of the grid will hit this machine. And ideally in a production grid, we'd, we'd set up a couple of locators. So you'd have failover. So the locator is the slowest process to start up and I have my log level as info, which is a more uh, verbose log level. So there's probably some logging going on. And I did try and compress the hard drive on this VM right before this. Hopefully it didn't cause any problems. Because normally it's not this slow. Let's see. You know it's a live example. <laughs> Any questions so far? I'm just kind of babbling away up here. Do the, um, the worker nodes find the cluster manager automatically or do you have to tell them where it is? 
So you give everything that joins, and there could be a problem here, it's usually not this slow. Everything that joins is given a collection of IPs for the locators, and you can designate... Okay, so it started. It's just really slow for some reason. Oh, I see it there now. Yeah, so you can see some information. Can I step on this stage? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so our locator started. Um, you can see the JVM arguments. So obviously when you're dealing with an in-memory data grid, JVM is, is really big, so you do a lot of JVM tuning. Um, and, you know, all our details are here. So that's the IP that it's on, that's the port, it's got JMX enabled. Now a server process is starting. So let's take a look at this server process. So again, this start, G, uh, start server, it's a gfish command, it's just j starting the Java process, the gemfire jar. Um, it's got a class path. You'll notice there's a bunch of jars in the class path. Class path is important because it contains the Gemfire binaries, but also we're going to embed our own Java code in the grid. It needs to know where to find the dependent jars. We've got a server port. So this is the port that clients will connect to. So there's really two types of communication in in-memory data grid. There's member communication, and then there's the client-server communication. So when you're in a memory data grid, when, two, when the cluster is running, the nodes are constantly talking to each other. So we have a protocol where the node pings the node, one member pings the one to the right of it to say, are you still alive? So that big ugly thing is everything that's in the class path, quite a, quite a few things. Um, so it always pings the node to the right of it to say, are you still alive? If it doesn't get a response within a certain period of time, and you can configure that, that latency window, it will ping the... Um, Senior member, which is the first member you started, which is generally a locator, to say, hey, this guy's non-responsive. The locator will try that guy. If there's no response, it'll get kicked out of the grid. So should it rejoin, they'll remember that it used to be a member and now it's not. Now, there can be disk stores. So things are stored in memory, but it can get persisted to disk. If a member rejoins after being kicked out, it, they'll say, look, your, your data is no good here anymore. You've been out for three seconds. Forget everything that you're going to restore. We're going to synchronize you up with new data. And we're going to talk about how data is distributed. So this is really weird. Normally the grid starts up in literally about three seconds. Um, I'm packaging these VMs up to distribute them, and I was monkeying around with um, how to make the VMs a little smaller with all these VM tools. So what we include, and most in-memory data grids have something like this, is some sort of monitoring tool. Ours is called Pulse, and what we have here is one server in the machine with three members. You can see our total heap is two gigs. We have three members, one locator, two servers. So servers are these two guys. They're going to store data. They're going to, you can deploy logic to them. Uh, they're going to do kind of the work. And the locator is going to direct the traffic. And this box stands for one. So a lot of people that are using this may have 16. Uh, I think our biggest install out there has about 75 individual machines with various Gemfire processes running. Um, so you can also see a concept called regions. So we're going to take a quick look at regions. But while we're doing that, I'm going to spin up another set of processes and expand our grid. So what I have here is another VM, again, CentOS. And it has all the same binaries. And its server processes, so it starts up two server processes. They're designed to connect to this locator. So I have a slide that's animated to show how the membership communication works. But in a few seconds, as the process starts up, and you'll see some messages appear here on the side. We should see another server appear here. And you can also watch the heap grow as it scales up. Uh, so we'll just wait for that to happen. Uh, I guess if it's as slow as the other one, it could take a while. Trust me, it's fast. <laughs> Faster than this. Um, I'm not quite sure. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, so that's, that's starting up. So, so while that's starting up, we'll explore our regions. So those are the members.
I'm sorry? So that you, you want to have multiple locator processes, uh, like many of them actually. Um, if you lose all your locators, it, it's a problem. The, the grid won't function properly anymore. Now there's different, you always don't have to have locators. You can do a peer-to-peer -peer network where you start a member and it just talks to other members and the data is identical across. So that's a pattern we use when we implement Gemfire for session caching. Um, we can talk about that. This is a collection of regions. So region implements Java Util map. So each one of these regions is a map. And you'll see um, there's different region paths, um, but there's types. So we have partitioned and replicated. And you'll see the member just increased and the heap went up. So uh, we've just admitted a new member, and you'll see over here server C has joined. And in a second, you'll see members go up to five and the heap increase further, and server D will join. So as you can see, scaling it up and scaling it down is, is pretty simple. It just is starting a Java process, essentially. Network, obviously, is highly critical. You need to have good bandwidth connection between these members, because right now, between these four members, there's all kinds of chatter. And even a delay in response between some of those messages can result in members getting kicked out. Uh, so getting back to these types, partition, Replicated. So replicated, every process has a copy of this customer region. So remember, it's a map, key values. So the keys, the values are our customer objects. If any single change happens in, in this region on any of the members, the change is broadcast across the whole grid. So in theory, and you can wrap that in a transaction. There's transactional support as well. In theory, uh, or in practice, Every single node will have an identical set of customers. Now, remember this is Java. So we've got a limit on heap. So if you have a really large data set that isn't going to fit into a single JVM, you move to a partition model. So the idea with partition is I give an object to the grid, and it distributes it. So if I give 1,000 objects, it gets spread across, let's hope, fairly evenly so, you know, 20% or so would go to each of the members. Now, if you lose a member, you lose a set of data. So when you use partition, you set up redundancy. So redundancy, I might say, might be a level one, level two. So the data gets sprayed across the grid, but then for every primary copy, I have a secondary copy. The cool thing about that is writes can only be against the primary copy, but reads can be against any copy. So I increase my read performance by adding redundancy as well as making it highly available. Now, the neat thing that this product provides um, is it has a great retention for data. So I can have partition data that can be uh, redundancy zone aware, meaning it won't put a copy on the same server. So you can have it aware of the fact that it's distributed across. So my redundant copies are in different machines. Um, I can implement disk stores. So disk store means any time something changes in memory, it's going to get written to disk as well. So if the process dies and it starts back up, it can re restore from disk. But there's also a setting, when it writes to disk normally, when a lot of things write to disk normally, they give it to the file buffer of the OS, and you're just sort of hoping that that file buffer writes. And normally it does. We have a setting with this product where you can force that flushing of the file buffer. So the idea would be if I had partition copies and I do an insert in one place, it has to go into this key value map, this hash map. Can you just wiggle my mouse, please? Thanks. Be written down to disk, then the to memory, and it written down to disk. So it, you can wrap all that in a transaction, and the nice thing is once it's committed into the system, before that response gets returned, you have a lot of redundancy set up. So it's great for making data you know, available with low latency, but also highly available in terms of fault tolerance. So partition and replicate it, those are our two strategies. You can see persistence is turned off here, so everything is entirely in memory. Um, so th that's, that's the grid started up, and a little bit on grid theory. Let's take a look at an application that uses it. So we'll see it from the front end. And then we'll take a look at some of the code underneath. And I've broken up the code into concerns. Um, so I've got my model, 
which are the actual objects and persisting in their keys, as well as repositories. Has anyone used Spring Data in here? Okay, so I'm using Spring Data heavily on this, but there's other approaches as well. Um, there's server-side code. So this is code that gets deployed into the Gemfire grid and executes in each uh, node. So that's in a separate project. And then I have an application which shows you how to work with a client. So let's start the application up. I'm using something called Spring Boot. Has anyone played with Spring Boot or heard about Spring Boot? Okay. It's a cool, fun little thing. I'm so so uh, this I'm going to show here. So a Spring Boot app essentially creates a jar. It's got uh, Tomcat embedded. So I can start my jar. Why is there? Oh, OK, there we go. I can start my jar. You can see the star jarring, uh, jar starting up. And it's listening on 8080. So here's the app. Um, it's an order taking system for a shoe store. Um, it's a, um, meant to show how Gemfire can act as a system of record. Um, it also shows how it can do some in memory calculations. And there's some interesting read through and write through features that we'll explore as well. So here's the product. Right now, we started a grid and this connected to the grid. Let's take a look at the configuration for connection. So I started this up, and the cool thing about boot is it gives you a main class that runs, and that when, you, when I start the jar, this application class is going to run. And you notice up in the top, I've imported a resource, which is cache config. So the first thing that gets bootstrapped in or loaded in is what's in this cache config. So let's take a look at that. I can remember where I put it. Yeah. It's actually easier to read on there than it is in here. Um, so this is our, my configuration. So this is a client configuration. So you'll notice, do you remember those regions? Customer, product, alert. Here they all are. These are client regions. And I have a pool. The host is my locator. And I can put a collection of locators in here. So the first thing this does, and if we take a look at Pulse, it'll say, hey, a client just connected. Um, let's take a look at that. I'll show you something else, too. So you'll see here's some messages. It's detecting some activity. Another thing you can just do is come in on JConsole, hit the locator. And if you go to mbeans, Gemfire member. So there's all kinds of specific feature things here. Um, oops. I connected to the server. So that was just server stats. If you click to the locator, you get system wide stats. So if we go into Gemfire, you'll see there's a distributed section. And if you go into system and attributes, you can see there's locator count and you can see there's number of clients. So that's me that I just connected. Um, so going back to that configuration, I create a pool. Now, a um, couple interesting things here. I've registered a serializer. So when you write to Gemfire, it serializes your object. And we have one built in. It's reflection-based PDX. This product was created in Portland, and the area code for the airport is PDX. It also has um, portable document exchange, I think. So I've basically given it the class path of my, where all my objects are, my model. And it's going to serialize and deserialize those for me. Um, if you use this PDX serializer, it also allows you to exchange objects from different languages. So I can actually serialize a .NET object or a C++ object, and in this client, get it back. Now there are some types that are not interchangeable. So in those cases, I can extend this and create my own serializer with a true data from data, and then based on the knowledge 
of this other object, let's say some something in .NET I may not know about, I can figure out how to convert it. Yes, exactly. The neat thing about PDX too is the way it stores it, if you want to get the value of an object, it actually has like the name and then the value. So you can actually get an attribute from the object without instantiating it on the Gemfire side, just by the way it's written it to, to disk. Continuous query is an interesting feature. What I've done with this, so if you take a look here, This is my continuous query. Now, this product, all in memory data grids have some sort of query language. Ours is no exception. It's called OQL. We're querying objects. So I'm saying select star from product, which is a region where p dot stock on hand is less than or equal to 22. So very similar to Hibernate uh, query, um, syntax-wise. Now, what's happening is, as I connect it as a client, I registered this. And I have a subscriptions enabled in my configuration. So the grid now says, okay, this guy is interested in subscriptions and he's interested in this query. So now anytime any client connects to the grid and changes that product region, this query is executed. If it returns true, the object that made it fire will be sent to my copy of product. Also, I can put a callback method that Gemfire will call, and it gives me a nice little hook to execute some sort of logic. So it's neat that the grid can actually call you as the data changes. As well as being a memory, you can call it frequently as well. It, it's very scalable in that way. Now we have some other things, function execution repositories. We'll see those as we go along. And the nice thing working in an IDE is um, we can come in here and there's tons of properties. So you can see critical heap percentage. Um, you can set behavior. So if you hit, let's say, 80% of your heap, you stop accepting puts. But, or sorry, you, yeah, you stop accepting puts in the grid, but you might take gets. So there's all kinds of configuration options. Um, far too many to cover, cover here. But working with an IDE, you know, it's, it gives you some help in that. And we have extensive docu documentation. So what I'm going to do is put some base data in the grid. Um, I've created a very simple boot app which wraps a Gemfire client, spins up, and then parses a bunch of CSV files, converting them to objects and throwing them into the grid. So this is giving us data. So on the client side, I have some JavaScript that hits repository endpoints in my app, and those repository endpoints pull the server, the grid, to populate this data. So you'll see, um, and of course, for whatever reason, those VMs are running really slow, but you'll see these numbers start to increase. This looking good is actually where the continuous queries are published. And we can see what that callback method looks like. So I have here um, this CQ. So this, I've annotated it, my CQ listener, and in my configuration, I said call the CQ listener. So this is what gets hit to handle the event. So what I'm actually doing is taking the object that Greg gives me and putting it into a WebSocket, which I create when my application starts up. So I create a WebSocket when it starts up. And then on the application side, using SockJS, I grab what's on that socket and render it to the UI. So you can see we've got some numbers here. Um, so some interesting things that you can do. Uh, so, you know, all the features you'd expect are there. But because it's an in-memory data grid, it can do some really quick things. So it can parse, you know, millions of records and return really quick results. So, you know, I can do this sort of thing. Now, an interesting thing happens here. I'll put an order for this guy. Order complete. 
we come here, you'll notice he has a transaction score. Um, what I've done, and we'll take a look at the code, is I've embedded functions into each node of the grid. So what happens is the transactions are partitioned across the, the nodes. So I have five nodes, the transactions are spread across there. Every time someone makes a purchase, we need to figure out what their Discord score is. And it's a count of transactions, but if you do three transactions on a day, three or more, that's an extra point for you. If you do transactions on your birthday, that's an extra point. If you do three or more transactions on your birthday, again, that's an extra point. So we do this sort of complicated counting to figure out what sort of discount we can do for people. And the nice thing is I can wrap that into a jar file that I deployed to each node, and it runs on its set of its partition data, and it all runs in parallel. And then my client gets the results. So I have five nodes, my client gets five integers, and then based on that, it can determine, determine the score. So it's a nice way to get, you know, distribute data and get a quick result. Um, so we got some, we ha now have one value in the system. So if we go back to the VM, this data is done. So this little boot app now will hit the system with 25 transactions every second. So we'll see it starting up here soon. Okay, finally. So you can actually see in the logs here, uh, multicast was disabled using uh, TCP IP to contact the locator. So there are our stuff coming in. Now what's happening is these are callbacks from the server saying these items matched your query. Um, we're pulling the server every second and getting these counts and then just deciding what we should display. And this is just a count of the total orders in the system every second, which HiChart is displaying for us. Um, so as you can see, because of its low latency nature, it's really easy to hammer it with requests. And especially if you partition your data with the right re redundant number of copies, reads are very fast and cheap. And also this sort of callback nature gives us this nice kind of, you know, proactive updating based on changes in data state. And, you know, we can grab one of these, place an order. Now here's an interesting thing. I'm going to order a million shoes for this guy. Obviously we didn't have that kind of stock. So we go home, we've got one back order, and we come in here to messages and it says lack of stock, couldn't do this. Now an interesting thing Gemfire offers, and most in-memory data grids do, are read-throughs and write-throughs. So if you ask for a key and a null gets returned, you can have an in-memory data grid get that value from somewhere else, like a database, file system, Hadoop, wherever you want. It hydrates the grid, returning you the result, and then keys will return true for that unless you expire or kick it out of the grid for some reason. This is going to demonstrate a write-through. So there's certain situations where Stuff that's in memory, I may need to get it on a message bus or get it to a database or somewhere else. So Gemfire in particular has an asynchronous queue. So I can basically batch up objects and asynchronously send them to somewhere else. So if we go on our VM, I've got a MySQL, oops, got a MySQL instance here. So we'll show tables. There's a message table. We'll select star from message table. And we'll see here is that message that we just put through. Lack of stock, you know, tremendous amount of shoes. So that's a huge back order for us. Um, let's take a look at what that looks like. And let's actually explore the server side configuration a bit. So we'll come in here to resources.
we go. So this is what is configured on the server side. So because of Spring, I'm able to rope in, you know, wire in some other things. Um, so I've got something called a transaction listener. So you can add listeners to regions, and essentially what a listener looks like, let's take a look at the code. And it jumps. This is what the listener looks like. So there's different lifecycle events that occur. So this is after create, there's update, there's delete, there's destroy. So I basically, you know, implement or extend this cache listener adapter. And then I can basically say on this transaction region, every time something happens, and this is synchronous, apply this logic. So in this case, when a transaction happened using a product repository, we get that a reference to that product, find it, and then minus its stock level by the quantity of the transaction quantity. Uh, so the order size. So we're basically, if somebody ordered 25 shoes from a certain product, we grab the product, get the stock in hand, and minus 25. Because if it got to this point where it's in the transaction region, then the transaction is completed. Now the nice thing is this happens synchronously, so when this put completes, this operation has to have completed too. Of course, the downside is if something's slow here, my put in the transaction will be slow as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So going back, it's exactly a trigger in the database. Yeah. And a region is essentially a table in the database. Um, so going back, now here is what's doing the writing. We have this asynchronous writer, and I've mapped it to this region. Now the interesting thing is I have a lot of, so I can have it parallel uh, or uh, in series. Um, if we just look at some of the options here. So I can have batch size, so when a certain amount of objects are batched up, I'll as asynchronously write them. Um, I can have a timeout, all sorts of things. Now in the regions themselves, I can configure a lot of behavior as well. Um, so what are some interesting ones? Well, I can, can configure a time to live or time idle. So maybe after a certain amount of time, if a reference isn't used, we can drop it out. Now when we drop it out, we can have it written to disk or written somewhere else and keep the key in memory. So you reduce your footprint in the region by getting rid of the value, but if you hang on to the key, you can actually recall it. So Gemfire will write it to its proprietary disk store. In each process, it's using its own direct attached storage but it'll keep its key. So at a later point, if someone says, give me that key, it'll read it out of its disk store and put the value back in memory. So that allows you to kind of keep your entry count, but not necessarily use up all your heap. So a lot of configuration options there. Let's take a look at the repositories. Um, so there's a closely coupled Spring project that goes with this called Spring Data Jumpfire. Um, here are the repositories or sorry, here are the objects. So let's look at transactions since we talked about this. So all that I really needed to do was create a regular POJO and annotate it with that region and ID. And these are annotations come from the Spring Data Gemfire project. Now if we take a look at the repository to do CRUD operations, I extend Gemfire repository and my transaction, that's my value, that's my key. And then I can add these extra methods, but it also has a whole bunch of things built in. If we take a look at the test case, so here's our repository test. Let's say this alert repository. So I'm going to go alert repository dot. So here's what I can do. I can get a count. I can delete. I can check if a particular thing exists by key, find all, find one given the key, save. So quite a few, pretty much all the basic life cycle for an in-memory data grid. If we look at that repository, all I had to do 
was just extend the interface. All that was generated for me under the covers. So let's look at my test suite. So I've got my models and my repositories here. And what I can do is have my JUnit test case boot up uh, an inline miniature grid. Yes? So what, do you modify the transactions? Do you just modify one key or do you modify multiple? Like is there a sub-transaction manager or? Uh, well, well the... do you mean the transaction objects or transactions in Gemfire? So transactions? Uh, like a... There is transaction support and there is a transaction manager. So what I can basically say is I need to update these three things before this operation is successful. And generally the transaction is within the JVM, so within a single node, but you can't extend it to another one, in which case it has to spin up another transaction manager and the other node to orchestrate those, those things. That's a lot more expensive and can greatly slow your performance, but yeah. Um, so let's take a look at this test case run. So we can come here, um, we can run as a J in a test case. So what's happening here on the side is we're spinning up an inline Gemfire grid and we've embedded the locator and the server into the same process. So it's a single node that behaves as both a locator and a server. The null pointer exception was just, for whatever reason, JUnit test cases don't close very nicely. But you can see all my tests passed. Now if we take a look at that, so let's look at the config. So I set some properties here and I basically made this a locator and then I set up some regions and I enabled it to use the repository. So once this spins up, I can test, so I have a test here for my alerts region, for my customer region, for my markup test, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can see I can test all the different custom um, queries I've added. So some of these I've inlined my OQL, own OQL query to determine how it should get, get the data. Now OQL is not what I would call a robust query language. So there's a lot of things it doesn't do, especially if you're used to SQL. So sometimes when you're getting your references out of the distributed grid, you need a function. So let's take a look at what a function looks like. So this function is my order counter. So this is what counts the transactions based on my business rules and gives back a score I can use to determine the discount. So all I had to do was annotate it as a component so Spring's auto scanning can pick it up. And then the method that I want Gemfire to run, I annotate with Gemfire function. There's different ways I can target the function. So I can have a function, so I can have a client call a function remotely on the grid, but then I can have functions call other functions on the grid. I can have function scope to only operate on certain keys. I can group nodes together and server groups and have only those as the target of a function. So there's a scope you can control. Yeah? It, it has to be uploaded. If you look at the class path, so this jar is called fast foot server side. And if we go here, the class path I gave Gemfire when it started is here. And that jar is where this function is. So every member of the grid has to have this. And if you look at Gfish, so this is the command line tool I've been using via shell scripts to start and stop all this stuff. If I, if I add a new application, a new client application, I should... Uh, update the jar. Uh, without restarting or... It does, but you can do a rolling restart. So I can restart, so I can upload it to all of them and then do a rolling restart where I restart them one at a time and the grid can actually sustain a single member going up and down. That's how you upgrade as well. If you want to upgrade the binary of Gemfire, you can upgrade it. So push the jar out to all of them and then just restart them one at a time. So 
If we go to JFish, you can connect to a locator. And we'll see how the function is deployed. And yeah, I'm talking about all this speed. I swear to you, it's uh, not this slow. I've been messing with this VM. Uh, I wasn't fully ready to do this today. OK, so let's list functions. So we can see I have count by brand, count by type, count by transaction, and it's deployed on every single server. So there's really two patterns. You can do, like I said, a scatter gather where I basically say execute this function on every single node in parallel on the, on the data you have in your particular JVM and then return the result to the client that called it. So the client always gets back a collection of results. Even though my method... Depending on the number of nodes you have collection of... Right? It, exactly. So... Some kind of use I'm sorry? Well, so I, I'm responsible for that in the client. Let's take a look at my test case. So when I call this function, here's what a function call looks like. Here's that exact one. So this order caller, so I define that function. So basically it returns an int and it takes a customer object and it does a whole bunch of counting here and it uses a repository that we looked at to actually get the customer objects from the node it's running on. To call that, I just define this interface and I can say, you know, the region is transaction, I give it an ID. This is what's going to get called. And what Spring does is it generates all the underlying Gemfire API to make this happen. The underlying Gemfire API is a bit complex, so I recommend using Spring. But you can do this at a much lower level if you wish. Now, if we go to this test, I'm just grabbing, whoops, I'm just grabbing that function or that interface and passing in my customer object. What it returns is a list of integers. If I have 10 members, there'll be 10 results here. And it's up to me on the client side to figure out what to do with this. Now, if I made this call to a replicated, so let's say this function executed on a replicated region, the list would return, but it would only have one member. Because Gemfire is smart enough to say, well, I, why bother doing a scatter gather? Any single node has the exact same data set because it's replicated. So I'll just pick the one that isn't busy, have it execute the function, and then here's your result. So this returned a, a collection because it's partitioned data. Well, actually, that one's replicated, but Oh no, that one is partition. Transactions. Yeah. So again, same thing. I've got my function and I can run my test case. And once again, I spin up a grid in memory inside of this test case. And in my setup, I use my repositories to put a bunch of objects in. And I know their states. And then I call my methods and I get my results. And we'll see this complete here in a second. Um, what's that? Oh, that, that's really it. Um, so there we go. There's my test case. Um, so that, that's it. Uh, High-level overview. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually pretty much coming to the end. Yeah, uh, I mean, like I said, I didn't really have like a formal planned out presentation, so I thought being a room full of Java guys, I could just show it and we could look at code. So hopefully that was okay. Question? Yeah, well, no. If, if I... Yeah, well, yeah, it is. It, can you t give me some context in your question, like from a well, client? Data right. Stuff your I'm just wondering what, what's the Yes, yeah, depending on your network. Yeah. Um, uh, that, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. Uh, anything else? What, what else? Oh, so we have a project called Spring XD. 
Anyone heard of Spring XD? Maybe? No? Nobody. It's another Spring project. Uh, it combines Spring Data, Spring Integration, and Spring Batch. It's a neat little command line tool once you've added it to your class path. It has connectors to read from Gemfire and to write from Gemfire. So it can act as kind of, if you wanted to bulk load a bunch of stuff in Gemfire, you, you can easily do it with that. And yeah. Spring, Gemfire, because they're both made by the same company, there's a natural relationship there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Um, so this product was born from Wall Street. Uh, so all the original use cases were in-memory risk calculations around trading of equities. So that's really, this product is about 11 years old and probably the first six or seven years was just those use cases. Uh, there were some military applications, so where assets deployed let us know when something reaches a certain lower level because we have to send other stuff there. Uh, recently, we've added customers. And the downside about this is most of the customers that pick up this product um, don't want it known for whatever reason they're using it. So it makes it difficult for us. So I can say the industry and the use case, but I can't mention who it is. Uh, so we have people in travel. So let's say you're on a plane. Um, you can use Gemfire to track where everyone is, where all their luggage is, and the nice thing is, oh, a big storm came through, a thousand flights got diverted, and we need to figure out who to put what where, and then also make sure everyone's luggage goes together. So that's a nice in-memory computation you can run really quick to get a backup plan, and then deploy that out into the grid, and you have all kinds of other systems getting and using the grid as its system of record. So it's, it's, that's, that's a, where you have those quick changes of mass data set, that, that's a good place. Um, there's some sites you can go online to get trips and uh, hotels. And uh, they, uh, they use Jumpfire. Um, and, and they basically, a lot of them have, you know, uh, on big travel days, uh, there's a lot of load. And this can really scale out quick, scale down quick. Um, so that's a good one. There are some online betting companies that have used it, and it was interesting for them because once cell phone came, came out, people can be at a game and say, wow, this picture really sucks. These odds are way in my favor, right? So the odds are sort of changing, and now people know about them. Previous days, you know, you wouldn't really know, but now I can send information. So we have some online betting companies that do some odds calculations in memory, and they've used Jumpfire. A really interesting use case is, um, a rail company uh, in a country where a lot of people move around. It's a country with a lot of people. And uh, New Year's Eve, there's a lot of train travel. So they use a Gemfire grid to track how many seats are available on the train. Because they have a period of time where everyone is just buying tickets like crazy. Um, so those, those are a few off the, off the top of my head. That's it. Uh, so. Pivotal can buy you guys a round of beers. Anyone like beer? <laughs>